God bless you. God bless you. Look at this. We're in the house of the Lord, aren't we? Amen. Look at what I'm looking at over here. I see a lot of mothers here. I see grandmothers. And I see a lot of children. A lot of children. Pastor, we need a bigger building. Children are our legacy. Our mother's legacy. And with that legacy comes a testimony. I had a mother. I'm a testimony. Now, the legacy comes from beginning to end. Now, my mother passed away in 2014, but I'm in celebration today. I'm not sad. I'm in celebration today because my mother had a legacy, and I'm her testimony. So that's why I'm here, to share that testimony. But it's not a unique story. The reason why you're here, and have a seat. Have a seat. I got so excited for Mother's Day, I didn't even tell you. Relax, relax. Do you mind if I talk a little bit? You're already seated, so we'll spend some time together. This is a special day because mothers, as I said before, have a legacy, and there's a testimony that comes with it. The testimony that I'm going to share with you is part of a preaching, it's part of a teaching, and it's a testimony. It's one big soup. And I'm excited to share this with you. And uh, I'm along here with uh, my wife. She says, uh, I'm her baby. So happy Mother's Day, honey. <laughs> and certainly happy Mother's Day and happy Grandmother's Day to all of you. You know, I'm, I'm very excited because, um, you know, when I talk about my mother, and this is not just about my mother, it's, you know, we also have a spiritual mother. I, I'm, I'm pointing this way. It's like on cue. And I, uh, Pastor Melly is not here at the moment, but uh, I give honor to our spiritual mother as well. You know, my mother um, was very quick, just as all mothers have to be. And for those who walk with me, so those who know me, know I have this sense of humor. And I try to be very quick. My mother was very fast. She was faster than me. I, mean, I, I tried to learn um, to be as quick as her, but I was not quite as successful. She would, you know, even as an adult, I try to be smarter. So once I asked my mother... It's clever. You see, you look at the calendar, right? Why is Mother's Day before Father's Day? Why is Mother's Day before... And I'm a man, see? Why is... And, and I thought I had her. And I had a witty comment to say, because I always have a witty comment. Sometimes it gets me into trouble. But my mother, as always, was faster than me. My mother was smart. She said, so we can spend our tax refund on mothers. <laughs> you look at the calendar. Yes, that makes sense. Mothers are wonderful, aren't they? Aren't they? They spend the first two years of their child's life teaching them to walk and talk. Then they spend the next 16 uh, years telling them to sit down and be quiet. <laughs> wow, wow. We have a lot of mothers here at the Resurrection Center. We have a spiritual mother. See, I'm doing this again. Oh, there she is. <laughs> we have a spiritual mother, Pastor Melly. Let's give a round of applause for our spiritual mother. You know, our round of applause is not enough to honor our mothers and our spiritual mothers and our for everything that they do, and it's hard to put into words, but um, I spent some time preparing how to put it into words, and that's, that's what today's message is all about. So today we honor our mothers for good reason. We honor our mothers for good, good reason. Today I'll share a story of one such mother from beginning to end. It'll be from her start as a mother to her final finish. As I said before, a mother provides a legacy, and with the legacy comes a testimony. So I'll share that. So we'll go all the way through the journey, and you'll get the whole picture. And the reason why I spend the moment to chat with you about this 
is so that you who have mothers or you who are mothers or you who are mothers to be can get a sense can get a sense of where you're at and where you're going um you know, there's a reason why God put mothers on this planet. And we're going to find out. We're going to talk about that. You'll get the whole picture. Now, right now, as I said before, my mother has been having the best coffee in heaven right now. It's for about six. And I'm in celebration for her for that. You don't know how important something is until you lose it. And that's when you can really see the legacy and the testimony. So this is why I'm in celebration today. I'm not sad. I'm in celebration. I'm in remembrance. I look at mothers in a way of reflecting the past because your past is the foundation of your future. What you do is you take the past and you learn from it. You don't turmoil in it. You learn from it to go to the future. But in your past, who was there? It was your mother. In whatever form or fashion, okay? So my mother was from my past, and she is part of where I'm going. She's still today part of where I'm going. It's a good future. With God in the center, I owe a lot to my mother, as you owe a lot to your mother in whatever form or fashion. You will owe a lot to your spiritual mother because she's part of your past to direct your future. Our in future, my future, is influenced by what I celebrate today. Today is Mother's Day. Mother's Day with God in the center. It's not just Mother's Day. It's Mother's Day with God in the center. Because that way we are driven by the Holy Spirit to be obedient to our mothers, because that's in principle, in the Bible. And our mothers guide. They're encouraging their children to be people of God. Okay? So what does the Bible say about Mother's Day? You knew I was going to talk about that, right? See? So the Bible consistently asks followers to honor and love their mothers. You see that in the Bible. I'll just mention a couple of places. Right at the beginning. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. That's Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Quite simply, it says... Honor your father and your, your mother. Now, just like that other question I try to be witty, I, I would have asked my mother, why does it say in Exodus twenty twelve, honor your father and your mother? Why does it say father first? She's, she won't answer that. <laughs> in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 3, every one of you shall revere his mother and his father. So mothers are to be honored. Not just respected, but to be honored. The respect follows. Did you know how smart mothers are? I just told you how smart my mother is. So moms have a lot of wisdom. They always have the right answers. Here's a story of when I was a little boy. When I was a little boy, I was very philosophical. I hadn't really started. I understood that there was a Bible when I was a little boy, but I didn't know what was in it. And so, so I asked my mother, how did the human race appear? My mother answered, mom answered, uh, God made Adam and Eve, and they had children. And all mankind was made. It's in the Bible. Oh, wow. Okay. So you know how kids are. They ask mom a question. They got to go to dad. So I asked my dad. The same question. And he said, many years ago, there were monkeys. There were monkeys from which the human race evolved. I was confused. I was a young boy. I went back to my mother and asked, Mom, how is it possible that you told me that the human race was created by God? And dad said they developed from monkeys. My mother had the right answer. She said, well, Dave. Well, Dave, it is very simple. I told you about my side of the family, and your father told you about his. (laughs) 
You got to be one step ahead. I could never keep up with my mother. Oh, my word. That's that part, the monkey part's not in the Bible. Pastor, I'm just letting you know. <laughs> Who remembers the tornado on uh, June 1st, uh, 2011? You remember, hand of, raise the hand, and people remember, there was a tornado. Okay, so after the tornado on June uh, 1st, 2011, there was a made-for-TV movie. It was filmed uh, in Forest Park. It was in August, and it was be part of an event that was here. It was called the Springfield Community Festival at the Bing Arts Center as a gift to the city. Well, as part of it, uh, there was a movie uh, that was shown. It was called uh, Your World Discovered, and the pastors were in the movie. Pastor, for those who didn't hear on mic, Pastor Melly says, don't show that thing. It's been streaming on Amazon. <laughs> It, it actually does quite well. It's called parenting and, your, uh, parenting and Growing Up. Okay. Well, at the time, our parents were not ordained at the time. They just had their 10-year anniversary. See, go way back. To, their daughter, Rebecca, had just turned nine. And it was talked about in the movie uh, that, you know, she loved to play soccer. And they explained that they had how they met when they were teens. They explained the story in the movie. And Pastor Melly, and, and this is the reason why I mentioned the movie, is because Pastor Melly, 10 years ago, explained what it was like to be a mother. That's why I just recently watched it. So I could explain, 10 years ago, this is what Pastor Melly was saying. She's laughing now because she thinks I'm about to say something witty and funny. Nope, nope. <laughs> She's, <laughs> She's talking about the hairstyle. Uh, who am I to joke about hairstyle, right? Don't laugh, Pastor. <laughs> so this is what she's quoted as saying. She said it was great, and it's a struggle with ups and downs, with family support and grace of God. That was the first thing she said. What she said, she wasn't alone. She, she loved it because she said it was great. She knew that there was trials and tribulations. That's why there's struggles with ups and downs. But she had family support and the grace of God. This is what I was talking about before. Pastor Melly said 10 years ago that God was in the center. She also said she's thankful to have the opportunity to be a mom. She knew it was a blessing because God was in the center. As an aside, she also mentioned they accomplished the dream. They had a dream, and God fulfilled God has favor and provision. She had a dream of going to Disney World in Orlando. They had just got back. Okay? And she had talked about making dreams come true. That's Pastor Melly 10 years ago. Give her a round of applause. And incidentally, your hair was wonderful that day. <laughs> Pastor Jose says, it was? <laughs> We learn from Pastor Melly what a mother, but more importantly, Pastor Melly, from my, my point of view, for a spiritual mother, okay? So as a mother and a spiritual mother, a mother believes in you. Is that true? Mother believes in the future of their children. Next, a mother makes you look your best. They want to make sure that you look good in school. They want to make sure that you look good for the world. A mother knows your future. I don't know how. But a mother knows your future. A mother comforts you. A mother shares the beauty of the world because a mother wants to show their children the beautiful world that they live in, not the bad. A mother never forgets. <laughs> I, I heard how Pastor said, mm -mm -mm. we're talking about that belt or that shoe, right? I, I wasn't referring to that. <laughs> I, just, I just heard how he said, mm -mm -mm. <laughs> a mother takes care of her children. She takes care of all of her children. A mother is efficient. They have to be. 
they have to not only take care of themselves, they have to take care of their children. A mother knows the pain of loss. Pastor was talking about that uh, before we went on air. Pastor was talking about that in his opening prayer. A mother knows the pain of loss. But a mother uses that to carry things forward. So it's not, they don't get stuck in the turmoil. They carry things forward. A mother knows true love. And I'm not just talking about who they get married to. I'm talking about a mother knows true love of not only for their children, about who their children are going to meet. A mother wants her children to be happy. Those are 11 things. Does that describe Pastor Melly? I think so. Does that describe all the mothers here? Amen. Can you relate to this? I will tell you the story, as I told you before, of my mother. The story I share is not unique because the wonderful things that a mother does is the same thing that my mother did. So I know what my mother did for me. Therefore, I know what your mother did for you. And if you are a mother, what you do for your children. But it is one of full circle. Full circle. From start to end. From the first child to being called to heaven. And I share this out of celebration. Because... When my mother was called to heaven, she had a legacy. She left a legacy behind. That legacy is her testimony. So my story, as I said, is like your story. If you are a mother, then you will understand. As I share the story, think of God in the middle. Everything I, my mother did for me, I multiply it by eight. Everything my mother did for me, I multiply it by eight. Why? She had eight children. When she says she thinks of each of her children individually, that wasn't a cliche. She really did. She really did. Um, I grew up with the love of a mother. When she went to heaven, the love remained. That was the legacy that she left. And I carry on the love to up. The testimony. That is why I celebrate today. I still carry the love. It's a feeling God teaches us through mothers. It's mothers that have the love of their child, which te- teaches the children the love that we can receive and pass on to others. All mothers can teach us about Jesus. Every mother is able to love her children no matter who they are or what their circumstances are. That love remains. A child doesn't have to earn maternal love. A child has the maternal love. However, it turns out to be so natural that even when the child is in the womb, the child begins to learn something special about their mother. When mothers accept love, and show affection to their children, even when they make mistakes or fall short of expectations, this is unconditional love. In other words, it is a form of love with no strings attached. Therefore, parents love their children for who they are no matter what. Jesus teaches us unconditional love. That's why I say God is in the center. The story I'm about to tell you is called The Night the Lights Went Out in Boston. That's the title of the story. The Night the Lights Went Out in Boston. Every time the lights went out in Boston, a light was shining, and my mother was there. Let's go back. Let's go far back. Let's go back to the year 1955. You might think of the year 1955, looking like the TV show Happy Days, which was released in 1974, or the movie Grease, which was released in 1978. I think in the 1970s, they were celebrating the 1950s. 
Do you, is the theme of happy days going through your head right now? <laughs> Do you picture Fonzie on his bike? My, she's, <laughs> you can't get it out of your head right now, right? <laughs> My mother always said the 50s were her favorite. She, she always said that. So let's talk about 1955. 1955, right in the middle of the 1950s. It was 10 years after World War II, and Dwight D. Eisenhower was the 34th president of the United States. Boston Airport started to become a major transatlantic uh, gateway a year before being renamed the Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant General Edward Lawrence Logan International Airport. So it wasn't even called Logan Airport at that time. It was Boston Airport. The 1955 World Series matched the Brooklyn Dodgers against the New York Yankees with the Dodgers winning the series in seven games to capture their first championship in franchise history. Martin Luther King Jr. earns his Ph.D. from Boston University. A gallon of gas was 23 cents. <laughs> 23 cents. The first polio vaccine was announced on April 12, 1955. Yep, they were talking about vaccines back then, too. The story begins on an autumn day in 1955. Not on the ground, but in the air. At 25,000 feet, aboard a TWA Boeing 377 Stratocruiser heading eastbound. The day was Halloween, October 31st, 1955. It was a four-engine propeller aircraft. That's what the airlines had back then in 1955. It was slightly bigger than the bomber my father flew in during World War II, so a lot of these aircrafts looked like military aircraft. My father flew a, a Liberator B-24. It was four propellers. So anyways, that day, it was the night the lights went out in Boston. On Monday, October 31, in the year 1955, it was raining heavy, and it was 57 degrees. The claps of thunder were strong with gusts of winds. There were power outages everywhere, and the Stratocruiser was in the air. A flight bound for Boston Airport was turbulent. Around 30 minutes out, descending below the cloud line, a 33-year-old scientific entrepreneur was focused on writing on a yellow pad. He looked confident. Very confident. He's writing on a yellow pad. A future time, I'll tell you what was on that pad. A 22-year-old woman had her eye on the 33-year-old man. There was something about him. <laughs> she had just turned down, she had just been turned down for an airline stewardess position because her left eye was brown and her right eye was blue. My, my wife's eye, my, not my wife's, my mother's eye, left eye was brown and the right eye was blue. She had applied for a position at TWA back then, that was the big airline, okay? And they said she might feel self-conscious because of the appearance. She never was. She was another one who was confident, just like my father, with the yellow pad. And she was, when her brown and blue eyes noticed Doc. That's the man's name. His name was Doc. Curiosity and confidence and a spark was felt inside the woman called Marianne. That was her name, Marianne. The plane descended below the clouds about 30 minutes out. Anyone in flight knows that. It's about 30 minutes out when a plane starts to descend. Um, and that's when the propellers, they were churning through the stormy air. The city below, as they were flying into Boston, was familiar territory about 30 minutes out. It was Springfield. They flew over Springfield as they descended, uh, coming over a dark, cloudy, rainy, and thundering day. Lightning lit the sky as they descended the cloud line and flying through. Doc, he grew up on Dwight Street in Springfield. And Marianne grew up on Roosevelt Ave in Springfield. They never met in Springfield because of the age difference. They were 11 years apart. They didn't go to the same school. The plane flew on towards Boston, and in the, in the city, 
the storm intensity increased. There was the wind, the lightning, the thunder, the heavy rain, the power outages. The wind buffeted against this propeller aircraft. The lights went out in Boston because of the storm. The four propeller engine uh, TWA Boeing 377 Strider Cruiser landed in Boston Airport with a small stable bounce on the rain-soaked runway. It wasn't called Logan yet. A year later, in 1956, the airport would be changed to the Lieutenant General Edward Lawrence Logan International Airport. So that's why I'm saying Boston Airport. But on that day, on October 31, lightning lit up the sky as the Strato Cruiser rolled to a stop at a terminal at Boston Airport. And Doc and Marianne walked off the aircraft as thunder boomed outside. The city had no lights. Only 103 days passed, about 28 percent of the year. Three months and 11 days. That's right, three months and 11 days. On Saturday, February 11th, it was windy and snowy. The temperature was slightly above freezing, about two or three degrees uh, above freezing, but it was still snowing. And that's when Marianne became the wife to Doc. They got married three months and 11 days, and they met on an airplane. Um, God doesn't waste time. <laughs> Just saying. God doesn't waste time. Husband and wife holding hands walked out of the Needham, Massachusetts church. She with a white coat and he in a dark black suit and tie. The pictures show the snowflakes falling at, in the early evening, and the picture shows the wind from the snow. It was a windy day. Not a bad weekend, just days before Valentine's Day. In that same year, on Monday, October 24th, 1956, it was snowing, and the next day was a beautifully enchanted white Christmas. It looked so elegant outside, just like you see in the Hallmark movie, except it's real snow. Um, it was also the first day that Marianne Ewan became a mother. That's where the story begins. That was a good week. Later, a few years later, by 1961, my mother had four boys. My mother always looked forward to a girl. She wanted a girl. She had four boys. Raise your hand if you have boys. You have, you have boys? Okay. <laughs> I, I, I had to stop. The look on her face. It, you just stopped the whole service. <laughs> so you got any boys? <laughs> well, at that time, uh, my mother didn't know that to have a girl it would also come with a boy. Twins. <gasps> She's so cute. You, you catch on quick. <laughs> um, to f she didn't know that she would learn an important lesson for a mother. In my family, we say this is probably the most important lesson. To fight for her life so that she could fight for her children's life. That was the most important lesson. It was after the summer midnight on August 10th, 1963, when the unthinkable happened once again on a stormy night. On a day of strong, damaging thunderstorms with uh, temperatures around 70 degrees, Dr. Kenny at Faulkner Hospital in Jamaica Plains, which is now called the Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, had already been up for 24 hours. He had delivered my four older brothers, um, and my mother was rushed to the emergency room. It was 5 o'clock in the morning, and Dr. Kenny had already been up for 24 hours, um, and he was exhausted. The fight was on, and the choice by medical staff was made, save Marianne, save the mother. My father was giving my mother shots, because Dr. Kenny was exhausted, there wasn't enough staff. So that's what my father was doing. Let me tell you about that delivery room. If it was illegal, it was happening. <laughs> but at that time, it was a wartime effort. The fight was on. It was to save Marianne. The twins were considered lost. It was a defining moment of a mother's fight for her life and her children's life. People at the hospital thought the twins may not be saved. Just before uh, 5.30 a.m., a little girl was born, followed by a boy rushed to recovery to be stabilized. My birth certificate says 5.24 a.m. 
So that's when I was born. The storm raged on the next day as it was windy and stormy, and it dropped down to about 66 de degrees. Boston had no uh, power. It was the night. Once again, the lights went out in Boston. But in that darkness, my mother was there. When it was time, the twins arrived home to now a family of eight with six children. Later, two more children would come by 1970, and my parents had eight children. So that's the story of the eight children. My siblings would agree with you that what we learned from our mother is what I mentioned before. A mother believes in you. A mother makes you look your best. A mother knows your future. A mother comforts you. A mother shares beauty of the world. A mother never forgets. A mother takes care of all of her children. A mother is efficient. A mother knows the pain of loss. A mother knows true love. A mother wants her children to be happy. I'll give you some examples. I'll talk about how a mother believes in you. You're looking at a person here who went to kindergarten twice. I couldn't even pass kindergarten. So <laughs> what happened was the language back in the day, so we're talking about the 1960s, the language back in the day is I was clinically, that was the clinical word, retarded. I was retarded. There was an understanding that the delivery back in August 10th of 1963 when the lights went out in Boston, that there was a problem. Uh, later on, I still remember, for those that know me and know I have a crystal clear uh, memory, I remember uh, my parents taking me to a doctor and the doctor evaluating me. And, and we just, you know, it was all day. It was an all day thing. Um, and then um, we got home and, you know, we had a barbecue at the house. and. I never knew what, what that was. I, I had to wait, you know, like 20 years later. What was that all about? And, you know, that's what it was. So, but my mother believed in me. And, and what happened was, remember, I'm a twin. I have a twin sister. And what, what happened was is when my sister went to first grade, I, went, I was in kindergarten for a second time. And what they were thinking of, what kind of, and this is before bullying was really made aware of, but see, mothers are bright this way, is, is that what would happen at around high school? What would happen in middle school? Here are twins, one's ahead and one isn't. What, what would that be? So they pushed the issue and uh, did a lot of side education, development work, whatever it was that I needed. And I remember spending the extra time. I remember being with one teacher, working with a book, being excited about reading, and, and then my mother would come in her, it was a 1963 VW bus. I don't know if you remember. See, when you have a large family, you need a VW bus. And that's how I got home from the hospital that day, by the way. But, but that's, I remember the extra training. And then I went into second grade with my twin sister. So it, fortunately, the issue was resolved, and then I was able to move forward. So the point is, my mother believed in me. She took charge. She brought me to the training, and she gave me the encouragement. Let's talk about number two. A mother makes you look your best. Um, my teeth growing up, I don't know what it was, but I had teeth that were perpendicular to the wall. They could receive FM radio stations with the angles that they were. I had teeth every which way. I looked like, uh, you know, something from a science fiction movie. A jack, oh, worse. Scary. Scary. So I had braces. And my mother spent the time to pick a doctor that had a good sense of humor. Because back then, I was a very shy, quiet person. Um, so it took... Uh, longer than what normally would be. Normally, braces could be around one or two years. I was about three to four years. Um, and, and, and also, it was important not only for appearance, but the ability to use your teeth for survival and for living. So uh, she helped me with that. Um, the next one, for number three, a mother knows your future. I, I just mentioned it. Uh, now, 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 I'm holding a microphone. I'm in a camera, and I'm, you know, 
all, you know, talking to you all dressed up and all. But, but see, this was not me. This was not me. I used to be the, the quiet, shy one. I had no friends. I had really no friends. Even when I was at the university, um, no friends. For, for much of my young adult or even as a childhood, I had no friends. And it, w it wasn't because the people were bad. It was me. I just couldn't connect. I was very quiet. But I remember that my mother and I, we were walking in, um, in Quincy Market, and we were looking at the stores, and I was talking to my mother. My mother said that I was a ham. Now, this is years ago, back in the 1970s. What's a ham? A ham is a person. See, Aaron nods. You're old enough that you know, right? You're not supposed to nod. Then people say, who's that old guy? I'm not afraid to show, afraid show how old. I already gave the year, so I'm lost. So a ham, for those that, for you youngins, um, a ham is a person who's very talkative, very social. Um, and and uh, she said that I would probably do, you know, a little bit of radio or television, be one of those talk show hosts. She said that uh, out of all of her children, I'd be the only one that would run a business. I was 12 years old at the time when she told me this, you know, and I just laughed at her. Everything I just said that she said, that happened. Being a business owner, the business is 27 years old this July. Um, so, but she knew that. Your mother knows your future. If your mother says you're going to go on to be, or if the prophetess of the house says you're going to, just say, that's Pastor Melly saying it. No, if she says it, it it's going to happen. It's going to happen. A mother comforts us. A mother comforts us. I'll tell you how my mother comforted me. Remember I said that my mother uh, looked at us individually, and it wasn't a cliche. She really did. Well, my favorite dinner, my, the, the di mm, I'm drooling already, is a roast leg of lamb with mint jelly. So I love a roast leg of lamb, and she just made it so moist. I just, it's true. That's not a joke. I'll have to cue the man when the jokes come. I'll let you know when the jokes come. <laughs> Am I going too fast for you? <laughs> so, um, and then for my oldest brother, his favorite was lasagna. Was lasagna. See, Pastor Millie goes, yes. Pastor Millie makes it the way my mother, I, I've told you that before. She kind of makes it the way my mother uh, ma makes it. But the reason why... Um, my oldest brother, his favorite meal was lasagna, and he was born on, as I told you before, on Christmas Eve. So the, the tradition in our household was lasagna for Christmas Eve, and it was just absolutely amazing. And, and each one of the eight children had their favorite meal. So like on her birthdays or, or I'm just thinking of you today kind of thing, she would do that. Um, but she did that for me, and I always uh, remember that. Um, the next thing I want to talk to you about is a mother shares the beauty of nature. In the backyard, she had this vegetable garden. And I remember the tomatoes, the cucumbers, and the carrots. And she had us work. Not hard, but just sort of participate. And it was just a beautiful area. Um, and, and I just really got to know that she really loved the earth that we lived on. Um, she also liked outside uh, outdoor sports. Where's Chris O'Brien? Where's Chris O'Brien? Oh, there he is. He's, he's in the booth with a headset on, so he can hear me. He'll appreciate this. He's, he's my hockey fan over here, right? The bees, right? Um, it was my mother who taught me how to skate. It was my father who taught me how to build the skating rink. We built uh, a very large skating rink because, you know, eight, eight children. And um, I never saw my father skate, ever. He never skated. But I knew how to build the skating rink. And I know how to, it's like muscle memory. You never forget. We, we knew how to even use uh, a special method to make 
smooth ice. But it was my mother who taught me how to skate. Uh, my father taught me how to build the thing. And it was my older brothers that taught me how to pay, play hockey. Right, Mr. O'Brien. That's what the bees are all about. Okay, and so that's one of the things that my mother taught is, is, is that the older children would teach the younger children, and it would be participating. So even for the skating rink, I'd get the skating from my mother. I would get how to build the thing through my father. My older brothers would teach me how to play the sport. And so what, what my mother was doing was pulling us together because it's very hard when you have a larger family, uh, especially where, you know, you got some kids in elementary school, kids going to uh, uh, high school. It's just a different age. Um, I told you before, my mother remembered everything, and I, I get that from her, and it, it's a good thing. Um, but what she did is she had this black amethyst ring on her finger. And w if I went into the living room, she said, Dave, Dave, oh, yes. And uh, she said, I switched my ring. She, she moves her ring to her other finger. She said, I moved my ring because I needed to remind you of you have track practice tomorrow. Oh, and that's how she would do it. She would, not only did she have a crystal clear memory, she would actually have tools like switching rings to remind her to, of certain things she had to tell not only me, but Deb, Dave, Dan, Don, Becky, Bruce, Mark, everybody. That's how she would call us. She would call us uh, into the, you know, Don, Jim, Bruce, Mark, Deb, Dave, Dan, Becky. It would be like uh, a poem. So that way she'd name all the names and not miss one. <laughs> oh. So I, I'll give you an example. That's how she would call us to dinner. So this is how a mother can handle all of her children. See, a lot of them. Um, my mother knew how to round up the flock. <laughs> There's eight of us, I told you, right? And we love to play hide-and-go-seek. We like baseball and hide-and-go-seek. But hide-and-go-seek with eight children, that's a little difficult when you're outside. We could never find each other. <laughs> the question I have, why did we play the game? <laughs> we could never find each other. But, but my mother could find us. She could. She had this boat horn. I don't know if you've ever been sailing. He's got this boat horn with this horn on it. <laughs> and we heard that, and we'd all be running. We wouldn't just say, oh, mom's blowing the horn. We would be running because it was 5 o'clock dinner. Roast leg of lamb. I'll be the first one there. So she was very clever that way. My mother was efficient. Now, she would often go to bed early to wake up the next morning early. And she'd be cleaning the house uh, without the distraction from the eight children. As a kid, I remember someday she would go to bed at 7 o'clock. And it wasn't because of activities during the day. It's because she had to be up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning to do laundry, to get myself ready, to get my siblings ready for school, and everything to ready the next morning. And, and I would see uh, the, the, the school lunch. We, we always brought school lunch, uh, brown paper, Dave. And, um, and I remember the way she wrote it, A. It was a different script style, but it said, said Dave. And in it, I, I loved it. It was the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, these homemade brown, brownies, uh, maybe an apple or something. And, uh, but there would be a lunch for every individual person ready. She would be preparing that for the next morning. Mondays were a special day. Mondays were called cleaning day. She said, that's the cleaning day. What does that mean? It's a special day of focus. Stay out of her way. We all knew <laughs> it's cleaning day. We all knew we weren't supposed to disturb her regimen. Okay? And, and she already had a plan for the day. Um, another one, number nine. Uh, a mother can feel loss. I talked about that before. A mother can feel loss. And this is similar to what... Pastor Jose was in prayer for a couple of times this morning before we started our broadcast. Um, on Monday, May 26, it was Memorial Day in uh, 1986, and at that time I was 22 years old. It was a Saturday when my 28-year-old brother was uh, killed in a car accident at 9.15 p.m. at night on a windy night um, it, on Sunday morning. That's when I got the call. Uh, back then, you know, this is the 1980s. The laws were different back then. 
the Boston Globe immediately printed his name and had the whole story in the, in the newspaper before I knew it. Um, and uh, so, and I was working that weekend, and so I brought the newspaper over to explain why I would be, why I would be out for the rest of the day. Uh, I'm going to be out. Uh, I'm going to be out. And I, I opened the newspaper and showed that. Um, my mother learned that with loss, there is life. Um, it's not easy. Uh, it wasn't easy for our family. Um, but we all learned so many years ago, back in 1986, um, what it was like to go through something like that. It was Memorial Day weekend. It was a holiday weekend. So it was, for me, the first time among many what a holiday loss is like. Here in the United States, you know that the summer holiday experience, as I call it, begins on Memorial Day weekend. Um, so that was obviously a different summer for us. On Labor Day in that uh, September, that ends the summer holiday experience. My twin sister had the first of our three boys. And that's when the family got together and said, with death we saw life. So in the darkness, God shows his light. Amen. And because my mother was strong, we were all strong. Because she did not collapse, we did not collapse. Uh, because we knew, you know, looking at my mother and father, we, we knew that our strength would be more towards my mother. So if my mother showed the strength, we could be with the strength. Um, number 10, my mother knows true love. On March 30th, 2002, I met my wife, Maria. You've heard the story. Blah, 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 blah. You've heard the story. And if you hadn't, we'll tell you another time. But four months later after I met her, I proposed to her. Two months after that, we were married. So from hola como esta to see, it was six months. That's the only translation I'm going to do. That's it. That's all you get from me. It was my mother. In the short time, uh, you know, during my engagement, it was two months before I got married. It was my mother who suggested giving me her mother-in-law's engagement ring. It was my mother who, who said that. My father said, if it doesn't work out, I want the ring back. I agree with him. I, I understand where that was coming. But it was my mother who knew. So the ring that's on my wife's right now is the ring that I refer to. After meeting my wife and getting married in six months, my mother said, remember, mothers are smart. My mother said, what took you so long? <laughs> well, for her, she did it half the time. Remember, she was on a strato cruiser. Blue and brown eyes, both looking at the man. I continued to see the love of my mother through my mother-in-law. So um, a year after we got married, um, we went to New York, and in Rockefeller Center, we brought um, her parents to live with us. They're from Columbia, and uh, her father has passed, but uh, her mother's still with us. And sh she was saying very nice things to me when I said, Feliz Dia de Madre, and something like that. And then she said something, and my wife had to translate between the two of us. But I was happy, and she was happy, and so it worked. I, all kidding aside, I, do, I joke a lot, but I really adore my mother-in-law. And I think the reason why I adore my mother-in-law is I know that she adores me even greater. So, uh, so uh, oh, okay. We're going to digress. Uh, here's what I call my mother-in-law. Actually, the, the truth story, I said, Feliz de Tigrita. The reason why I call her Tigrita is she's my suegra, but uh, for a cute mother-in-law, it's suegrita. People are looking at me on camera and saying, what, is he teaching Spanish? <laughs> Only here at the Resurrection Center. So that's suegrita, but she has pajamas that makes her, that makes her look like a tiger. That's where Tigrita comes from. You like that? You like that? You like that? You like that? 
And if you're wondering if we're doing Spanish lessons here at the Resurrection Center, no. <laughs> Um, in more recent years, uh, my parents had moved from outside of Boston to South Deerfield. Uh, I moved to Sunderland in 2000, um, about th uh, three miles away. South Deerfield is, you, you may have gone up north and you see the Yankee Candle Factory, you know, the big store up there. And there's that park, it's got the tower on the top. That's called Mount Sugarloaf, okay? So they were um, on the north side of that mountain. And on that mountain, because they're on the north side, they don't get the sunlight as much. So we really had um, a really nice snow, okay? Um, it's a, the state park with the service road up to the top where there's, that, that's where our first date was, that's where I married, uh, proposed to her, and that's where we got uh, married. And my parents live on the north side of that mountain. Um, we always had white Christmases because it was cooler there. And uh, so if there was no snow in Springfield, we certainly always had a white Christmas there. It's about a 45-minute drive from here, so it wasn't far. Well, in the year 2014, uh, it was moving very fast. That year, 2014, not long ago. It was a very comfortable 70-degree summer day. On Saturday, July 26, during a family reunion at my parents' house. Um, interesting thing about family reunions, it was always around the 4th of July. That year was July 26. Um, <laughs> what we called it was the dog's birthday. <laughs> so we celebrated the dog's birthday. So um, uh, the wind on the mountainside was refreshing. The bright sun was warm. Uh, my wife had a nice long conversation uh, with my mother. Uh, they were at the kitchen. My mother just sat down and just called my wife over. Um, she remembers that day, and she knows that... Um, you know, my mother uh, adored her very much. Both my mother and father uh, adored my, my wife. Um, on that day, we didn't see it coming. It, it came out of nowhere. That would be the last time we would all be together. We, we didn't know that was coming. Um, a month later, exactly 30 days, so from uh, July, now it's August 26th, it was windy and sunny at 72 degrees. It started to be a beautiful day. The message that afternoon of my mother afflicted with uh, aggressive stage four cancer devastated the family. But the strength of my mother and her faith in the Lord made her accept what was to be. Our hope endured. A month later, on a warm autumn day on Friday, September 26, 2014, it was Winnie and Sunday at 60 degrees, a beautiful day. The happy sun was peeking over the mountaintop because it just took a little longer for the sun rise over the north side of the mountain to put a glow over my parents' house at 9 a.m. It was a windy day, so the trees were waving their, um, their, the leaves in celebration. The, the blow against the chimes against the window, there was chimes, you know, the metal chimes near the window. It, it was beautiful. It was sort of glass, and the aluminum was like singing angels. The smell of autumn was just starting as a new holiday season, uh, my favorite season is, is the fall, was to begin with leaves changing colors. The glow of the sun shone brightly. At around 9.20 in the morning, it was my mother's time to return home to the Lord. It was a time for her legacy. Her last words were, I tried the best I could. That was 58 that was 58 years after being on a TWA Boeing 377 Stratocruiser on the day the Knights went out in Boston. Proverbs 3131, honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. And that is why she has a legacy, and we are the testimony. Number 11, my mother always wanted her children to be happy. She wanted her children to experience love, the same kind of love that she gave. Well, my wife makes me happy. If you haven't figured that out already. <laughs> In December uh, that followed the passing of my mother, I asked Maria to renew our vows. And the reason why is because she makes me happy. On Saturday, January 17, 2015, at 1 p.m., the snow was on and off on a brisk, cold, windy day. It was way below freezing. For those that attended, we were at the previous church on Allen Street. 
on that Saturday. The chill in the air was warmed with our ceremony to renew our vows as it would have been my mother's wish. That's why we did this. Later that year, my father went to be with the Lord, too. It was sunny and 52 degrees with a slight breeze to, to add chill to the autumn air on Friday, October 8th, 2015. It was an hour before sunset when the sun would be going down. My father had passed uh, shortly after 5 p.m. The sun was setting when I got the call. A few weeks later, it was a wonderful day of a celebration of life. Um, we were in celebration. It was a windy, chilly day with an occasional slight raindrop at 37 degrees on Saturday, October 17th, 2015, um, at the cemetery. The clouds were beautifully puffy. It was the day to say goodbye to my parents. There were smiles, there was laughter, there were stories, all, all the stories that, that came out. Then it was time. As the moment... As the moment ended, my wife and I walked away and we remembered the story of when the night, the lights went out in Boston. Because every time the lights went out in Boston, a light was shining. And my mother was there. Again, I read Proverbs 31, 31. Honor her for all her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Let today be a day of new light, of new shining for all mothers on this Mother's Day. Remember, a mother believes in you. A mother makes you look your best. A mother knows your future. A mother comforts you. A mother shares the beauty of the world. A mother never forgets. A mother takes care of her children. A mother is efficient. A mother knows the pain of loss. A mother knows true love. A mother wants her children to be happy. My mother always had a sense of humor. She really did. I've told you that before. So I have one more story to tell you. Do you ever get blamed for something you didn't do? Did that ever happen to you? Something happens, you didn't do it, and you get blamed for it. Don't you hate that? <laughs> well, one day I came home from school, and I went straight to my mother. My mother solves problems. I went straight to my mother and said, Mom, today my teacher punished me for something I did not do. I didn't do it. I got in trouble for something I did not do. My teacher scolded me. My mom was very angry, and she went straight to my teacher and scolded the teacher for scolding me. When my mom came home, she said, I scolded your teacher nicely for scolding you. Hmm. Teacher. Then my mom asked, by the way, Dave, what was it that you didn't do? And I answered, I didn't do my homework. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. All stand, raise your hands, and uh, close your eyes. Dear Lord, we pray in gratitude for our mothers, grandmothers, aunts, mentors, and all women who nurture in a motherly way. Please grant these women the courage needed to endure the challenges that lie ahead. We thank you for the sacrifices of self each mom gives her children. We ask you, Lord, to be the source of spiritual and physical strength. Dear Lord, may we love and cherish the special women who have borne us, who have nurtured us, and who have prayed for our well-being. Amen. You may all be seated. The story today, the purpose of today's story was to show that mothers have a legacy. And in that legacy comes a testimony. I hope today that this message shares that if you are a mother, or if you have a mother, or if you're a mother-to-be, that there is a testimony to be told from a legacy that happens. May you be blessed. I understand there's a celebration with our youth leader. Oh, someone else will. God bless you, everybody. Let's give.